In this module, we are going to introduce the concept of equity or stock. We're going to talk about the overview as well as different classes or different types of stock that we could be dealing with. So first of all, what is equity? What is a stock? Equity, if you remember the balance sheet equation, the basic accounting equation, we said that assets equal liabilities plus equity. Equity represents the ownership of a company. So you have all these assets out there. You borrow, let's say you have $300,000 of assets. You borrowed $100,000 to buy some of those assets. So you have $100,000 in liabilities. You must have the other $200,000 as equity. So this is the ownership, people that have actually invested in the company to become part owner. And it's the, the shares, the stock. Now, we could be talking about this with either a corporation or a, a regular sole proprietorship or partnership. For this topic in this module, we are going to be assuming this is a corporation, so we could actually talk about true stock. Now, equity is, again, it's in contrast to debt financing through liabilities, specifically bonds. So we have two options here. We can either borrow money to have investment or we could obtain equity financing by issuing stock. Now, if you have an owner, they share in both the risks and rewards of the company. So they're investing their money. They may not get any of it back. They may lose their entire investment. They're never entitled to anything. They're never guaranteed a return. Now, one important thing to note here an owner, they own the company. Now, if you have a sole proprietorship, that owner has a very lot, a lot of power. They, they own the company. Nobody else has more power in that company than they do. But if you have stockholders, they don't have direct control over the company. They can't make decisions and tell the managers what to do. Instead, they control the company indirectly through representation, the board of directors. This is very similar to how we as citizens elect Congress, congressional representatives, senators, to represent us in our government. We don't vote on every single thing that comes through. We vote on representatives to take care of those things for us. It's the very same thing in the company. Now, as an investor, you invest your hard-earned money. You hope to get a return at some point. And there are two main returns that you could expect, depending on the type of company you're dealing with. The first one might be a regular dividend. So these are more of short-term returns. Now, an important thing to note, this is not like interest. If you invest in a bond, you expect interest back at certain points in time. Dividends are not expenses. They're not the same as interest. They're similar in concept, but they come from two different sides of the equation. So there is no guarantee that you will ever receive a dividend. That's the first thing you need to be aware of. There's no contractual obligation that you will receive a dividend. When you invest as a creditor in a company, you have a contractual obligation that you will receive interest. So that's a difference there. Some companies don't even issue dividends at all. Other companies issue them on a regular basis. The other return that is usually expected when you invest in stock is a long-term gain in value. You hope that the company will be successful, so maybe you buy it for $3 today. Down the road, it might be worth $100 per share. That's kind of the thought. It doesn't always happen. There's no guarantee. It could very well become worthless completely, but that's the risk you're taking for potential reward. Now, when you talk about these corporations, you could see multiple classes of stock. If it's actually a corporation, you have to have common stock. That's your base level of stock. So that's required. But then you have a potential for another class of stock called preferred stock. So relatively few companies have this type of stock. And when I say relatively few, I don't mean just a handful, but certainly it's, it's not a common type of thing. It's preferred stock. Now, even within the common stock and preferred stock, 
companies can have multiple classes of these types of stock. It's all based on the corporate charter, what they set up, what they want to issue, different levels of ownership. So let's take a look at common stock. Common stock, these are the actual owners of the company. They have the voting rights, they elect the board of directors, and each owner's individual power is based on how many votes they have. In other words, their proportional share of ownership. If you have 10% of the shares, you have 10% of the vote. Not really a whole lot of control, but if you were the largest single owner, if the other 90% of ownership was spread out across thousands or millions of people, then you all of a sudden have a lot more control than 10% generally would show. Now let's say you have 51% of the ownership, you have effective control. You have more power than any other individual or anybody else combined. Now generally you're going to vote on certain issues if the corporation, the board of directors decides to put an issue out to vote, then you'll be voting on that as well. But normally your main vote is for the board of directors to represent you. So here is a, an example of a statement of changes in owner's equity, just to show you the different things that could come in with equity. We're focusing mostly on common stock in this particular section. So here we had the beginning balance of common stock was 100,000 shares at $1 par value. So $100,000 issued. Now notice we have a, an account called additional paid in capital in excess of par. This is $200,000. This relates to those same 100,000 shares. Generally, we'll see this in a bit, but for companies that have this par value, that is the amount that gets recorded in the common stock account. But in this case, the price of the stock was actually $3 per share. The other $2 per share went to this additional paid in capital in excess of par. So that's an important thing to note for that. It looks like we issued another uh, 200,000 shares. At also at $1 par value. So again, we have $200,000 in common stock, 400,000 in the additional paid in capital. So the ending balances would be 300000 and 600000 for our common stock. This company doesn't have preferred stock. We'll talk later on about the treasury stock, what that is. So now let's dig in and talk a little bit about preferred stock. What exactly is that? What does the preferred mean? It gives the stockholders a preference. They are still owners, but there are pros and cons of preferred stock. The pro is that they get a preference in regard to the dividend distribution. So what this means is, even though there's still no guarantee that they will get any dividend at all, what they are guaranteed is that if any dividends are issued, they'll get theirs first before the common shareholders get any. So what this tells us, first of all, you have to remember the bondholders get their interest expense first. That comes first no matter what. And then if any dividends are paid, they go to the preferred shareholders. And then if any are left, they'll go to common shareholders. Preferred shareholders, generally you'll see the stock with a, a certain percentage or a certain dollar amount. That tells you what the, per, what the dividend is going to be or what it's expected to be. Again, no guarantee. So what happens here is that the preferred stockholder is taking less of a risk. They're more likely to get a dividend than the common shareholder. However, they're pretty much capped at whatever that stated amount is, 10%, 8%. It looks similar to a bond because it shows that percentage rate. It's a percentage of par value. That's how they calculate the dividend. They take less of a risk but they also don't get as much of a reward. Common shareholders take more risk. There's more of a risk they won't get anything, 
but the reward is that they may get huge dividends at some point in the future. So that's the thought. Now, they get a preference also with asset distribution upon liquidation. So if the company decides to go out of business, they're going to get their money that's still going to be after the creditors. They The creditors always get their money first, the bondholders, but then the preferred stockholders will get their money second, and the common stockholders, if anything's left, they'll get that amount. Now, the drawback to preferred stock is they generally do not have voting power. So, they, yes, they have ownership, but they don't have the same control that common stockholders do. So, this preferred stock is often thought of as a hybrid between being an owner and being a creditor. In other words, it's a hybrid between debt and equity financing. But at this point, even though there have been changes in GAAP, there have been discussions on how to handle this, at this point, preferred stock is still treated as equity, just like common stock. So now let's go back to that par value, which you'll also sometimes hear the phrase stated value. That par value which we saw with the common stock, it's a nominal value of a share of stock as stated on the corporate charter. This is not the issue price, and generally it's a relatively small round figure. Could be one cent, ten cents, a dollar, something like that. Now, that par value is very important for bonds and preferred stock because the interest and dividends are based on a percentage of that par value. But for common stock, it really doesn't serve much of a purpose anymore. A lot of it's more historical. What this tells us is called legal capital. The intent of this amount is to set aside a certain amount of equity that guarantees that this is the amount that will be returned for every share of common stock upon liquidation. Now, what that also ends up doing is keeping a certain amount of capital available, in other words, you can't pay it out as a dividend, it keeps a certain amount of capital in, in the actual balance sheet, which indirectly protects the creditors. What, what I mean by that is that if you have a situation where a company has a bad year, a string of bad years, they have relatively low retained earnings. So they have net loss after net loss after net loss. Their retained earnings have dropped quite a bit. Now, if the board decides to pay a dividend, declare a dividend, they can never pay a dividend below uh, what amount of retained earnings you have left. You can never force retained earnings to a negative amount. But if you pay it so low, let's say you pay it down to zero, and then the next period you have a net loss again, then what that essentially leaves you with is negative retained earnings. And if it's a large enough amount, it could create negative equity overall. Negative equity is never a good situation because if the company was to liquidate at that point in time, what that means is the creditors will not get all their money because we don't have enough assets to cover all the liabilities. That's why we have negative equity. And the reason we had negative equity, the reason we got into this situation was that we paid out too many dividends in prior years, and of course we had the net loss. So this legal capital is supposed to create a little bit of a cushion uh, limiting how much retained earnings we can pay out as a dividend. So I know we're touching that at a fairly high level here. We do talk more about the dividends later on. But that I just wanted to help define par value. The biggest thing to take away from this slide is that par value does not equal sales price. The big difference for accounting is that your par value is what gets reported in the common stock account. The difference, the sales price minus par value, is what gets recorded in additional paid in capital. So again, that whole legal legal capital, the, the par value, we'll talk more about that in more advanced modules. And this is basically what I was talking about in the last slide. So let's go back to a stock issuance entry. And we're going to look at two different situations. In this case, this was a par value stock. 
the stock issued at $3 per share, $1 per share was the par value. So we're going to be debiting cash for the full, oh, by the way, it's 100,000 shares. So it's $300,000 in cash. We would credit the common stock for just the par value amount, $1 per share multiplied by 100,000 shares. The additional $200,000 goes into additional paid in capital. So again, if you have par value, you're going to have two separate credits, one for the par value amount, the other for the extra amount of capital. If you have no par value, no stated value, the entry is easier. It's a debit to cash for 300000 and a credit to common stock for 300000 You don't have to worry about that separate entry for additional paid-in capital. So that wraps up our discussion of the introduction to equity.